about uh, biolog, we're talking about uh, anterior tube and API 20E, right? Last lecture. So these are kits that uh, they are semi-automated, which means uh, you do everything, you inoculate, then the results will come out. As opposed to manual, which means you have to prepare the test one by one by yourself. That's manual. Fully automated means everything from the inoculation uh, test and results will come out from that machine. For example, the VTEC uh, machine, okay? VTEC 2. So those are different levels. Uh, manual, uh, semi-automatic, and automated system. Okay? But all this carry out the test all at once. All at once. So this is a, a blunderbuss approach where everything is done all at once. So you have an isolate, then you carry out all this test at once. So from the set of tests, you will look at the, uh, find out the likelihood of core identification. This is all done automatic, but I'm just teaching you the principles so that at least you understand how it's being done. Okay? Of course, the real database will be more complex, more columns. Okay? For 20E, at least 20 columns of different tests. Right? And then you have, and this will be your unknown compared against your database. Your database can be in the hundreds. So definitely you need a computer, you need a software. Okay? You cannot do it manually. We'll do it. This is just for you to understand how it's being done. So first, these are probability. Probability of getting a positive result. Okay, so there are certain criteria. So if it's always positive, it's 0 0.99, always negative, 0 0.01. Okay, it is never absolute 1 or 0, because it depends on your database. No database is complete. No database is exhaustive. So we use 0 0.99 and 0 0.01. Okay? That's why the... All this database is proprietary. It belongs to the company. Uh, for usually positive, 0 0.95 and 0 0.05. And then the rest for variable result, it is the range from 0 0.05 to 0 0.95, depending on how many strains they test. So if they test thousands, then the number, that's why the bigger the database, the more confidence you have in the results. Okay. So if you have an unknown, that is a gives you a positive here, negative, and positive here. So it is most likely to follow taxon two, and not taxon one. So when you compare the unknown against the taxon one and two, for positive you just use the probability as it is, but for negative you minus it off. So this will be the probability. When you minus it off, you get the probability for negative results. Okay, that's why they do it this way. Then you get, you can see that immediately that the probability that the unknown compared to taxon two is so much higher than the first one, right? Very clear. Then what they do is they rank the likelihood based on the number of Taxons you have, number of taxa you have in the database. What they do is they divide against the highest probability to give you 100% against taxon 2, 0 0.002 against taxon 1. Okay? However, this is against only two taxons in your database. What if you have two taxons that is give, that's giving you 100%? Then it cannot be two taxons giving 100% likelihood, right? That's why you have to normalize it. 
You have to normalize the square, the score, by summing this up. Okay? You have to sum up 0 .0, 0 0.9312 plus 0 0.002. That's why you divide it over 0 0.933 and you get this normalized score. A normalized score is, uh, is useful when you have similar results, very similar results. Then your likelihood will decrease according to how many PEXA is similar. Okay? That's why the bigger a database, and if you get high likelihood, you will have more confidence in your results. Okay? What is the cutoff point? The cutoff point is 0 0.95. Okay? Cutoff point is 0 0.95. That is considered correct identification. Uh, less well described taxa is more than 0 0.85, you get it correct. And then, so the, big, the bigger the database, the more certain you are of the actual identification. So, Blunderbuss approach is one, one way, okay? The other is a dichotomous key approach. This one is a sequential steps, sequential series of tests where the following tests will depend on what you obtain. For example, if you have, if you have an isolate, you carry out gram staining and it's gram positive cocci. Uh, gram positive, you look at the shape, if it's cocci, then you do catalase. If it's catalase, it's cephalo cocci, then negative will be structure cocci. Okay, so that's the first uh, then after that, for cephalococci, if you carry out a coagulase, you have coagulase positive step or presumptive cephalococcus aureus. And here is presumptive cephalococcus epithelium. So this is how a, a dichotomous key approach. Okay. So these are quite straightforward because all this test does not require incubation. It's very quick. However, for tests that require incubation, then your dichotomous key becomes your, your dichotomous key approach becomes uh, slower. It takes longer time. Okay, so that's one of the differences between a dichotomous key and a blunderbuss approach. One mistake in a dichotomous key affects everything. Whereas in Blunderbuss approach, one mistake in one test can be uh, negated or can be compensated by other tests because everything is done by probability. So it is not so bad. Understand? So your likelihood will decrease, but it is not like totally up. Okay, so that is another difference between a Blunderbuss approach and a Dichotomous key approach. This is what we are mentioning just now, the difference between dichotomous key and Blunderbuss approach. So here, stepwise takes longer time, shorter time. Here, but then for dichotomous key, because you're doing it step by step, you don't need to do so many tests. Very specific, very selective. Because the number of tests are less. So because of that also, any atypical result will affect the final identification, okay? as I mentioned earlier. For Blunderbuss, uh, a large, larger number of tests, and then any anomaly can be compensated. So we call this, the identification is more robust. You have more confidence in the results that you are in, okay? So, so identification is always for specific purpose, okay, for practical purpose, either in the hospital, food industry, water industry. It is based on limited information and lack predictivity because you're only looking for specific bacteria. Okay, so once the bacteria is out, like if it's a non-pathogenic bacteria, 
you will be you will find that the results are haywire because it doesn't match any of the pathogens that you are familiar with. Okay, so if you are working with environment, environmental bacteria, go for 16S or go for biolog systems. Okay, so these are not suitable. Enterotube and API is not suitable for environmental bacteria. Okay. So for dichotomous key, usually prepared in-house, which means we'll look at the book. What we usually use is uh, Burgess Manual of Determinative Spectrology. Then we'll start looking at all the tests and then uh, coming up with a dichotomous key, suitable dichotomous key. Okay, so for commercial kits, they will have their database. So you can see, enterotube, 84 species, API have 102 species, biolog over 2,000 species. Other examples of dichotomous key. So these are all in-house. For dichotomous key, there is no specific standards. Okay, it depends on what tests you have available in your lab. It depends on what type of bacteria that you are always getting. Then you plan it like accordingly. Okay? There is no specific set of dichotomous key. So usually the best approach is to combine both. You use dichotomous key for the initial separation into their different family. And then use a uh, semi-automated method, maybe enter a tube or something, to look for the, the species. Focusing on gram-negative bacteria, or my part, okay? Gram-negative bacteria. So in gram-negative bacteria, it is gram-negative bacilli. Uh, in the class, gamma proteobacteria. So as I mentioned, gamma proteobacteria is the one where most of the bacteria can be cultured. It's one where you will most likely see the bacteria if you're working in the hospitals or in, in the food industry. All most of the bacteria are within this class. Okay? So first test, important test is your OF test. It's important because it separates out Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas jaceae. Pseudomonas is only oxidative. So it's very, very easy to remove pseudomonas from your other bacteria. Because these are typical bacteria that you will see in a hospital from there. If it's uh, fermentative, you carry out oxidase. Vibrio nasie for Vibrio cholera, Vibrio para hemolyticus, Vibrio onificus. Aromona nasie, Aromonas hydrophila. Very important in aquaculture. Okay? Then you hear the word hydrophila, hydro, related to water. Aromona hydrophila. Pasturella. Uh, Pasturella CA, you have Pasturella maltosida. Another important uh, bacteria in uh, poultry, poultry farming. Legionella, uh, Legionella CA, so Enterobacteria CA, you have lots of uh, all the, the, the ones that are familiar to you. Asterichia coli, E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella. Okay. You have Citrobacter, Citrobacter, Enterobacter. Even Seracia is under this. Okay, then Yersinia CA, so important test, OF. Oxidase. Then after that, you will use other tests like lactose fermentation and all that to separate them out. But the main two tests are OF and Oxidase. We've been talking about identification, right? Identifying a bacteria. So how does it differ from classification? So, so as I mentioned, identification is for a very practical purpose. Okay, you want to know whether there's any E. coli in your food sample. You want to know whether there's any Vibrio parahemolyticus in your prawn 
sample. This is for practical purpose, so you already know what you're looking for. You're only concerned whether there is. If there isn't, then that's it. You don't, you don't have to worry. Classification is for evolutionary relatedness and cataloging, which means classification means it's more for research. You want to know, okay, you have this bacteria, you want to know in relation to other species, other genus, where does it, where, which, which species is it, is it more closely related to? So usually for classification, if you have a few bacteria, what you need to do is you need to download similar sequences, sequences from similar species and other species within the genera, within the genus, and then you have to carry out a, uh, you have to do a phylogenetic tree. Okay? From that tree, you will see the position of your isolate within that context, okay? within that evolutionary relatedness. Where is it nearer to? So it's more like more of a research purpose, okay? And because of that, for identification, few tests are performed. Classification, many tests are performed. For identification, if you rely only on phenotypic properties, then there is a chance that it will be variable the age of the culture will affect. Okay, the age of the culture will affect. So, classification relies on both phenotypic, genotypic, and it's stable. And because it is for practical purpose for only a select few bacteria, there's poor discrimination, which is once you get something out of it, you cannot really tell what it is already. Okay? However, for classification, your database is very wide. There are the, the chances that you get hit is very likely. Okay? And also because it is based on a very select few bacteria, it is not robust, especially when you have atypical results. And for classification, it is robust. Okay, does not depend on only one test. So this is the difference between identification and classification. Okay, so when we go for taxonomic ranks, we have the domain, uh, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Order is the one with the less LES, then family is the one with the CA. Under this one, pseudomonadota, we'll be covering gamma, epsilon, beta, alpha, and oligoflexia. So under gamma protobacteria, we have all this that we want to cover. Covering enterobacterialis first, okay? So under this, we have enterobacterial CA, the the arrow here doesn't show clearly, so it's here, okay? So we'll be covering Enterobacteria CA, Yersinia uh, CA, and Montanella CA. So Asterichia, Salmonella, Shigella, Clepsiella, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Spatia. The most important are the first three, I think, yeah. Then Yersinia, very important pathogens.